I will start with my apologies for interrupting your well-deserved lunch after a fascinating session this morning. I want to, uh, I'm very truly honored to have the chance to address again this forum. That of Professor Dr. Mohammed Faiza Abdullah, uh, Chairman of the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, ISIS. Dr. Ko Kim Hoon, uh, Secretary General of uh, uh, ASEAN, Dr. Jose Rizal Damuri, Executive Director, Center for Strategic International uh, Studies, and 2024 Chair of ASEAN ISIS Network. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, my final ASEAN uh, Pacific Roundtable. After four uh, intense, truly memorable years in Malaysia, I will move to the Western Balkans in September. And as I stand here with you today, I think about my time here in Malaysia, but also about my 30 years uh, since I started my diplomatic career in 1994. And 1994 is a significant year, I will tell you why. And uh, of course, like most of you, and as was expressed this morning, uh, I'm truly worried about what lies ahead uh, in this uh, geostrategic upheaval. Because we see, as we all have agreed, more conflicts, denial of multilateralism, and the UN norms, and less cooperation. Moreover, in all spheres, there is a new sense of contestation. We contest territorial issues, like it is the case in South China Sea, specific issues such as uh, climate uh, justice and climate change, normative co uh, contestation, including highly targeted efforts for foreign information manipulation and interference. The current European elections, we are happening this uh, week, is unfortunately a case in point. We see a world that it is a lot more fragmented, a world where universally agreed rules such as the UN Charter or international humanitarian law are increasingly not being adhered to. In parallel, we see uh, more fragmented societies, the rise of far-right understanding of nationalism, which has an impact on foreign policy making. We see a more multipolar world, but strikingly multilateralism, as we see it everywhere, is on decline and we see how dependencies easily become weapons. And like everyone in this room, we see two raging wars with uncertain endgame. We see a UN Security Council member violating any sorts of norm that is supposed to protect and adhere. We see civilians being massacred daily, whether in Gaza or Ukraine, or in Myanmar, or in less captivating the public opinions outside places. Yesterday, the foreign minister talked about Sudan. The post-1945 multilateral order with the U.S. as hegemon is, uh, hegemon is losing ground. China is rising to a superpower status. Middle powers are emerging. Many are here present here today. They are becoming very important actors whether they are called BRICS or not BRICS, or so-called uh, Global uh, South, they have few common features except for the desire to have a say and more status and a stronger voice in the world, as well as greater benefits for their own development, which is normal and I think we need to salute that. So to achieve that, they are maximizing their autonomy, hedging on one side or the other depending the moment that it is relevant for any issue. So the motto of this uh, round table is crisis in interregnum. We all know from history that uh, interregnum can last quite long. It creates uncertainty, raising the question of leadership. How long the current one will last and how will it end? None of these questions can be answered without taking though into account geopolitical and geoeconomic realities of the Indo-Pacific. Because we all strongly believe that future international order is largely being shaped here. The IPR is a great forum to discuss that, and I want to truly wholeheartedly uh, 
congratulated ISIS for putting together a truly inspiring agenda uh, with a stellar speaker lineup. That does not include myself. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, how uh, has the EU positioned itself in this interregnum? Uh, I will make several times reference to why the High Representative Borrell calls it Europe between two wars. We Europeans, as you know, we wanted to create in our uh, neighborhood a ring of friends. High Representative said that what we have achieved or not achieved is a ring of fire from Sahel to Middle East, the Caucasus, and the battlefields of Ukraine. And now we talk about two wars. You know what, we are uh, what I'm referring to, but there are a lot more. In 2022, 56 countries suffered for, from some form of armed conflict. Many of them not making headlines. So when I became a diplomat uh, 30 years ago in 1994, there were also terrible wars. For example, the Western Balkans, where I will be heading in a few months' time. And there was genocide in Rwanda. However, the outlook at that time was far more optimistic. Maybe sometimes too optimistic, for example, when Francis Fukuyama claimed that the end of the Cold War marked, and I quote, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. In Europe, at the time, we were reorganizing the European Union as our fundamental peace pro project to make internal borders virtually meaningless. This optimism was not limited to Europe. Few remember that the round table, the Asia Pacific round table of 1994, the keynote speaker was Anwar Ibrahim, Prime Minister of Malaysia. He provided a quite optimistic outlook starting from, and I quote, Asia Pacific is probably the, large, the last region in the world to need confidence building and conflict reduction. On unresolved territorial issues, he added, if they are locked upon as mere irritants, rather than accorded focus and importance totally disproportionate to the reality, then they will cease to haunt us as a potential threat to regional peace and security. Please be kind with me tomorrow when the Prime Minister talks. But whether we like it or not, geography has come back to haunt us. And at the same time, we see an acceleration of global trends. The, claim, the climate breakdown is already there. Technological advancements such as international, uh, artificial intelligence are bringing changes that we can still not fully grasp. So the EU had to adapt to these challenges. To some extent, this has always been the case. As one of our founding fathers has said, Jean Monnet, Europe will be forged in crisis. But now, both the urgency and gravity of the challenges leads to several voices, and you have been reading them here, that the EU as a peace process could die, nothing less. And after decades of perceived peace dividends after the end of the Cold War, High Representative Borrell said that Europe has to learn the language of power. Again, not by choice, because our peace process was driven by the rejection of power politics. We largely succeeded in avoiding those power politics among the states that joined the European project. We believe that partnerships based on trade would bring peace and good relationships around the world. This was the driving force of our foreign policy, which, alas, proved to be optimistic, not to say naive. Therefore, now, we have to adjust our toolbox. And in the face of these two major wars, in order to protect our values and interests, we have to look at the world the way it really is and not the way we want it to be. So from European perspective, what do we do? Let me say a few words about the wars in two vicinity. A lot is being told, you know a lot. But I have to say that there is our clear assessment in Europe that Russia 
is for us an existential threat and we have a clear diet assessment of this risk now. And we need to work with this in mind. We constantly work with this in mind. When I became diplomat in 1994, because it's good to remember the past, it's only 30 years ago, things looked very differently. Both Russia and Ukraine have signed the Partnership for Peace with NATO, paving the way what later became the NATO-Russia Council and the NATO-Ukraine Commission. In 1994, there was also the year of the uh, Budapest Memorandum, in which Russia signed guarant to guarantee the territorial integrity and political independence of Ukraine. Again, when we looked at the Asia-Pacific Roundtable of 1994, I noticed that the panel on human rights under the title From Confrontation to Cooperation was actually co-chaired by a Syrian official from the Russian MFA. So today's reality is very different. I don't want now to use diplomatic or undiplomatic uh, uh, language of what uh, the EU believes about President Putin's action. But uh, Georgia 2008 and Crimea 2014 uh, gave us already uh, signals that we didn't want to follow. So uh, what has happened since? We had, of course, uh, the invasion of Ukraine. We stepped out our game. We created the peace facility and we proceeded to unprecedented measures to provide weapons to countries in conflict and also to mobilize close to 100 billion euros in support of Ukraine. And while we had the last years uh, not uh, far distant from last year's round table, the second war came. The horrendous terrorist attack of Hamas of 7th of October and Israel's disproportionate response plunged, plunged the Middle East to an incredible, the worst cycle of violence in decades. Just before the 7th of October, many believed that the Abraham Accords had diluted the Palestinian issue. Well, they have not. And this is clear. It was a way of making peace between some Arab countries and Israelis, but not between Palestinians and Israelis. And my personal uh, memories of 1994 again reflect wasted opportunities. It was actually 1994 when Arafat, President Arafat, Perez, and Jack Rabin received Nobel Peace Prize. But then the international community failed to capitalize into this incredible momentum. So now we are asking ourselves in the European Union with these wars, where, where do we stand as Europe? As we said, we always adapt to crisis. I believe the capability of EU to adapt and change and develop in multiple crises is on the making. But I would like to make a short reference to or perhaps a little bit longer reference to some three important dimensions, principles, cooperation, and strength. And those reflect a lecture by High Representative Borrell uh, at Oxford University, which I found is an extraordinary piece of foreign policy of the European Union. It is not only a soul searching, because I think since all these crises have been happening, we do a lot of soul searching on all issues. So we need to adapt, and I think we've woken up from the lethargy that we, we have been for several years. So let me say a few words about uh, principles, because for us, principles are important because it is our DNA. We are a union of values, and it's included in our treaties. And I have to say that this morning I heard notions that uh, for the EU, uh, values uh, is a sense of hidden nationalism. I do not agree with this because it goes far beyond. They, they reflect our values, the Charter of the United Nations, and actually they are truly universal. And I think in the European Union, we have the principle of looking at them that they apply to each citizen, each individual, whether it is in the European Union of any faith, of any belief, whether they are uh, in the Middle East, in Palestine, in Israel, in China, whether they are ethnic groups, the Rohingyas or the Uyghurs, you name it. So to put it in simpler terms, values, there are also human, uh, the international humanitarian 
law that we see also it is being attacked, but also the principles of how war is conducted. And there we see huge problems. But then when I live in Kuala Lumpur for four years and I travel around Malaysia, I find myself uh, confronted with the accusations of double standards. What is now happening in Gaza has been portrayed that Europe, in a way, many people simply do not understand. They saw our quick engagement and uh, decisiveness in supporting Ukraine and wonder whether this is the same uh, way that we approach what is happening uh, in Palestine. And I can try now, the, it's, it's not perhaps the appropriate place, to uh, be explaining the European uh, foreign policy decision making, which is unanimity, of 27 EU member states. I can try to explain uh, different historical experiences of our member states, and a lot of them are present here today, so I would be very careful with that. But there is division, not least as you see now that many uh, European countries have uh, recognized Palestinian statehood. But however, the perception remains that a value of civilian lives in Ukraine matters to us more than in Gaza. So this is a perception that is very difficult to defeat, but I would like to, to stress, take this forum, and actually with a lot of humility in front of you, to say that let it be no doubt. The European Union not only condemns or is appalled by the unprecedented loss of civilian lives and the critical humanitarian situation and is calling for immediate pause of uh, immediate ceasefire of hostilities and a conditional release of all hostages and unhindered uh, provision for humanitarian system. But is working with his partners around the world and supports the Biden plan with a view to a viable two-state solution and especially a Palestinian state that it is viable, prosperous, and the European Union is ready to support this in all endeavors. So please be no doubt uh, on that. So I want to say a word about cooperation. This requires an essential ingredient, trust. And we all know that the, uh, in a world where dependencies are increasingly weaponized, trust is in short supply. So uh, a trust shortage risks decoupling on technology, on trade, and values. And there, there are more transactional relationships and less rules and less cooperation, which brings inequalities and accentuates problems such as climate change and demographic uh, changes. So, as a EU, for a start, we want to reduce these excessive dependencies. We discovered when uh, COVID broke out that in the EU we do not produce a single gram of paracetamol. 93% of the EU imports of surgical gloves come from Malaysia. It doesn't mean we need to change. We need to enhance and reduce our excessive dependencies, but the solution is to create trusted partnerships. I'll come to that in a moment. So there's no doubt that we need to diversify uh, the, the links. And actually, there is no better place to do that than South uh, East Asia and the Asia Pacific, where we see massive uh, foreign direct investments from the EU uh, gaining momentum and a web of FTAs uh, going ahead, especially with ASEAN countries. Hopefully very soon, we will start negotiating with Malaysia as well. So we need also to look about how the so-called Global South feels about EU decisions, not least to our green laws that they have caused a lot of frustration in many countries that are present here today. And how also, and who is going to sustain the massive investment that is needed to address the real and present danger of climate change. So therefore, we need to find common ground, innovative approaches, but also we need to offer a solution as European Union. And I think that ahead of ASEAN 2025, Malaysia is in a great position to facilitate this kind of discussion with its chairmanship of 2025 coming ahead. The world will come to Malaysia. 
and the EU leaders that are going to be elected following to the, uh, this week's elections, they will all be here. And together with ASEAN, the two most successful regional groupings and natural partners, there's no better way of doing it. So uh, I think that uh, we have here a window of great opportunity. The Prime Minister again, last year at the round table, said that ASEAN regionalist mechanism has always stepped up when it matters the most, and I think it will do it again, and this is an opportunity not to be missed, and the European Union will be assisting in great length. Last point I want to say is strength. Uh, we have seen, and this is very unfortunate, that there is nothing that authoritarian regimes admire more than strength, the power of might. And when they perceive you as a weak actor, they will act accordingly. So I think it is in all interest to let us demonstrate strength when talking with authoritarian people or regimes. This is a lesson that we in uh, Europe have forgotten. Maybe because we believed for far too long uh, that uh, we relied on the security umbrella of the United States. But this umbrella may not uh, open forever. And I believe we cannot make our security dependent on US elections every four years. Therefore, we need to up our game, upscale, and we have to realize that we still live in this geopolitical upheaval that we call it interregnum. That's why we are developing our defense capabilities. It's a long list of actions that we do. Uh, only a week ago, the European Union defense ministers decided to strengthen the EU defense industrial and technological base. We have created uh, a new security operation under the name ASPIDES, which is uh, to secure shipping routes, vital also to ASEAN, uh, against Houthi attacks. And we are working with the many tools that we have created since in the war of Ukraine, and I think it will not be too soon you will be hearing that there will be a European uh, Union Commissioner for Defence after the elections. It is uh, a big probability. So against this backdrop, and unsurprisingly, all major actors continue to expand their military uh, spending, including the Indo-Pacific. Actually, the highest increase in spending is here in the Indo-Pacific because we are living in a dangerous and uncertain world. So what we need and we are convinced about it in the European Union, we need new trusted partnerships, we need solutions, we need commitment to manage the repercussions of this strategic uncertainty. We need to join efforts to fight against the scourge of misinformation and disinformation and the da daily cyber threats that we are all subject to. And we need to collectively help our societies fathom that our prosperity is in danger and what we need to overcome is overcome past misconception in order to face together the challenges that lay again. So I'm coming to my concluding remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that unlike last year, I have not spoken at all about the use new instruments and initiative in the Indo-Pacific. You are all, all aware of them. There are many, but maybe few points that are still relevant that you cannot any longer, in the EU we don't do this, cannot separate economics from security. They are strongly interlinked. Security and uh, the security in the Indo-Pacific and European security despite distance are uh, closely interwoven. It, uh, so as is our common prosperity. And in the European Union, we will continue to reinforce our presence and strengthen our engagement in the Indo-Pacific to contribute to regional peace and stability and be what we want to call ourselves as a smart security en enabler. So, thinking again back in 30 years of uh, diplomatic career, there is definite, we will, I think we can all agree that there is no uh, far away in a globalized world. So, therefore, uh, we see partnership and inclusive cooperation at the heart of our, the European Union's approach in the Indo-Pacific. 
That's why our trade agreements, our digital green partnerships are not merely sectoral or economic measures. They are not any longer blah, blah. They are not, it's not rhetoric, but the important means to strengthen stability, security, and rules-based international order. And we have the tools like the Global Gateway uh, Initiative. So with partners that they want to work with us, we can create relevant flagship uh, activities in any nation, especially here in ASEAN. I would like to emphasize that the Indo-Pacific countries can find in the EU a trusted partner willing to contribute to stability and prosperity of the region and its people. A partner with principled and long-term engagement. And I think the ASEAN 2025 will provide a great opportunity to dive deeper into this conversation as it is happening also for ASEAN 2024 in Laos. So, with that, it has been uh, uh, the greatest uh, privilege for me to share uh, a European perspective on the crisis in uh, Interregnum with you today. In the country that I know best, the Greek philosopher said that friendship is essentially a partnership. So I'm deeply convinced that a stronger trusted partnership among our nations is fundamental to bring back stability and predictability to the present shattered world order. And Aristotle went on and said, mentioned that fine partnership requires trust and duration rather than fitful intensity. So therefore also I strongly believe that EU, Malaysia, ASEAN, Indo-Pacific relations can thrive in this backdrop. So I wish the 37th Asia Pacific Roundtable, success in the liberations. It is a fantastic forum. I kudos uh, to you and ISIS and everybody participating. It's so stimulating. So uh, I think it's the best forum that exists in this part of, of the world. And of course, we are looking forward. Uh, this is not a forum where uh, we just uh, listen to ideas, but we register them and we try as envoys of our nations, of the EU, to bring them back to the opinion make, uh, makers and translate them into deeds.